So we met in 1973. You were the Catholic, I was the Hindu. Because I was so nervous, you know. You were from India, you know, our daughter is uh, American, how are you gonna get along? She came up to meet my parents, now you can tell what happened. Well, <laughs> I mean, I was just beyond nervous. I needed a tranquilizer. What's your favorite or the most cherished quality about each other? Did you want to answer that first? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Love Handle, a series where we get unfiltered about love and relationships. So our guests today are a power couple who had an intercultural marriage at a time when it was practically unheard of. And they've been together for more than half a century. We're so thankful to couple uncle and Margaret auntie for joining us and sharing their wisdom and telling us the secret behind their marriage. Welcome couple uncle, welcome Margaret auntie. Let's start with some introductions. I'm Margaret. And I'm Kapil. Please walk us through your love story. How did you two meet? So we met in 1973. Kapil had finished a, a second graduate degree of his, and I was an undergraduate. And we ended up in a, a course together. And the topic was about better communication in small groups and then just in general. So we attended the same class. And each week, the instructor would give us instructions about how to think about such and such before the next class. So we were asked to bring something with us to the class. In this case, it was, believe it or not, a grapefruit. You were to bring a grapefruit to the class and you were to, in the end, you were to go up to the person in the class and give it to the person that you would most like to get to know better. So I had already decided that I was going to give my grapefruit to Kapil. And so I went over to him and gave him my grapefruit. I think he had given his to an older gentleman that was in the class, <laughs> but anyways, and Kapil. So, you know, I was very appreciative and thankful to Margaret for doing that. And I thought maybe there's a possibility that you know, we could start uh, a friendship. You know, we don't go as far as seeing a relationship that's too premature and early. So after that, maybe in the next week or two, I called Margaret and asked her out for a date. The other thing about that, I always had imagined that a nice first date would be dinner at the beach. The setting is Southern California. I am a native California, and Kapil was at work uh, in Pasadena for a company called Burroughs. I was an undergraduate at a Occidental College, and so he called me up. He asked me, I think, to go to the movies. I said, no, I'd like to go to dinner at the beach. So he picked me up, and we drove over to Malibu. There was a restaurant there. And a restaurant had called Chart House. The Chart House in Malibu, which is now something right else. Water. Right on the water. And it's funny, Kapil, drove a car in those days that had bucket seats, but he had borrowed his roommate's car, which had a bench seat, you call it, you know, so you could sit closer. And um, of course, I didn't do that immediately. But anyways, and so then we headed out for the date. And I remember I, I had a new outfit, and which I have kept, by the way, I have the jacket and the blouse from that. I've kept to this day. And um, so anyways, we had a lovely date. And from there, we just started to date. So how long did we date before we moved up on her? It was June or July that you, anyways, Kapil got a job. He was recruited to go up to Santa Clara to work as a software engineer for Intel. And so really no one knew what Intel, at least in Southern California, it wasn't Silicon Valley, obviously. No one knew what Intel was in those days. And so anyways, but he went up there. And so then began our long distance romance. And so we, we did not live in the same area geographically again until we married in 1980. So we had a seven year period where we did not live in the same geography at all. It was so we did it for about a year? Yeah, a little over a year. Before we moved up. What were your first impressions of each other? Well, first of all, I thought he was nice looking. And also I thought he just looked interesting. You know, he just looked, and he was so different. Just the fact that he was Indian and he had said some interesting things in the class. And again, you know, if you were in Southern California today, sometimes it could seem like every third person is an Indian, but that's really not true in 1973. There were not that many Indians there. And so he was, you know, quite exotic. I thought, and interesting, and um, he just seemed to be very nice and quiet, and anyways, great. So from my perspective, she was very good looking, she was uh, uh, very intelligent, and much different than a lot of the girls that you, you know, I didn't have any girlfriend before that, and she had much ambitions, what she wanted to do. 
to be a lawyer. And she kept on that track. So I think uh, that was pretty different than some other girls who may have an objective of, I need to get married quickly. That worked in our favor. So we didn't have to make very quick decisions or get into arguments and so on. When are we going to do this and so on? But I think the best thing that happened to us was time. Time really played in our favor. You know, it took us six, seven years. We got to know each other pretty well by then. And the decisions came out automatically. We didn't have to set up any deadlines in times and so on. So by the time we got married, we had known each other six, seven years. We knew a lot about, you know, how to get along better. There are always challenges and issues, but, you know, then you, uh, how you o overcome that, okay? And so that was, I think, uh, unique. Well, and I don't think we were ever just friends, by the way. I mean, I think we have had a long-term friendship relationship, and which later led to getting married. But, but that was uh, our journey. Well, and I don't think we were ever just friends, by the way. I mean, I think we, anyways, it was a real romance there. But I was going to say that the other factor that played here was my mother was a big influence in my life. She's passed away. At that age, I listened to my mother, and she was very intent that I, she knew I wanted to go to law school, that I finished my undergraduate, because I was about a sophomore when I met Capil, finish my undergraduate degree and go to law school, finish law school and take the bar exam in order to get your license to practice law. So that's, I proceeded on that path with that in mind. And I, so I finished my undergraduate, immediately went to law school then. And then following that, uh, finished law school in two and a half years, because uh, it's normally a three year course. And so I graduated a semester early and graduated at the, end of a December, at the end of December and then took the bar exam in February of that year. And then we were, this is now 1980, then we're married in, in April of 1980. And so, um, and all of that with the goal of, okay, now let's finally get launched here. Because we were, again, we, we weren't in the same geography. So that was good, yeah, to finally get that done. And how did you evaluate your compatibility in the beginning? You know, let me answer that. It's not mathematical, okay? So I think uh, a lot of people these days that you read about it, you know, do an analysis after your first date. You know, what was good, what was wrong. I don't think we ever did that. And I think the, uh, the answer to that is that we were together for a long period of time, you know, in a relationship. And, and that just speaks volumes. So I think over a period of time, we were pretty sure that there was compatibility, okay? We, because we stayed together that long. And that would be the way I would describe it. And it wasn't, uh, you know, looking at the pluses and the minuses and, you know, what column is there. And uh, it's not mathematical. So you did not have a checklist? No, no, I was just happy to be dating have a nice person and everything, so no, yeah. So uh, the other thing that was important <laughs> to me at least and also to Margaret is, you know, how we got along with the families. You know, since I would go visit her every two, three weeks and so on, so I got to know the family very well. Her mother and dad, and they treated me very well. You know, I don't think there was ever a situation like, you know, you're from India, you know, our daughter is uh, American, how are you gonna get along? Never, no, you know, no questions about that. And they fully embraced me. And I think, although my parents were in India, but Margaret met them before we had gotten married, she had a similar uh, welcoming reaction yes. to, to them. Yeah. So, I, so I think that was important. A lot of times in, in a relationship, it's just two people and the families either don't want to get involved they don't support you and things like that. The art was not that case. Coming from such diverse cultures, were you scared that how you're gonna adjust with each other and with families? You know, I'll answer that first and say no, because I do think that I could tell that, I mean, Kapil is very gentle and respectful and very smart guy and um, ambitious. And it just seemed that those core values were there and I, I felt that, that that's really sustained us and that, that the cultural differences were not that great. I mean, of course they're there, but I didn't really feel like they were insurmountable in any way. Yeah, so you know, it's best to be in a situation where there are no preconceived notions. That she has to perform like this. 
or walk like this or cook like this and so on. We didn't have any. And she was a Catholic, I was a Hindu. I went to church sometimes and she would go with me to the temple and we'd have a priest at home to the ceremony. So we just accepted that. and. I didn't become a Catholic and she didn't become a Hindu, but those are not necessary. And that's the area where there are problems, when some parents or, or, or a community or so on objects to that. You know, you, you can't do that. And so ours was an intercultural marriage and, uh, uh, you know, her parents uh, had no preconceived notion. They were pretty open to that. My parents did not know this for a long period of time because I was living here. Okay, they were in India, but they surmised that something was going on. And when they got to know, and they were a lot more accepting than I would have thought. And then they came to the U.S. I went to India first time after seven years. And before I went there, the typical way I think would happen is, you know, the son comes home and very quickly, he pick a bride and get married and go back. But before I went, I had written to my parents that I'm coming home after seven years. I just want to spend time with the family. I don't want to see any girls or talk about my wedding. And my parents did not bring up the topic once when I was there. There was no such thing like you would say, oh, there's no harm in just you know, meeting a girl. You know, you don't have to say nothing. So I think it was a huge concession on their part. You know, they, they grew taller in not having to bring that up again. You know, not again, but at all, no question at all. Didn't put me in a spot that, you know, how do I disagree with my mother, that I had not told them about Margaret, although they sent something over there. And then they came to the U.S. And by that time, I told them that the young girl that I've been going out with, when you come here, you know, I'd like you to meet her. And when they came here, Margaret was in Southern California. I was up in uh, Northern California. And she came up to meet my parents. Now you can tell what happened. Well, I mean, I was just beyond nervous. So they were staying with him. And then I remember he picked me up from the airport. And I mean, I, could, I needed a tranquilizer. But anyways, and so then we got to the house. And my uh, mother-in-law rushed out to meet me and embrace me. And um, his father, of course, he wasn't an embracer. But, you know, he was very kind. And, oh, I just felt like I, you know, weighed 100 pounds less in that moment. I was so, such a relief. And so we, we met and, of course, and talked and spent that day together. Kapil, when he talks about going home to India for that first time, of course, I didn't go with him, but after seven years, you know, his mother was a renowned matchmaker. She had many, many matches to her credit. And so here she had this son in America who was successful and they were so proud of him and everything. And I think she was waiting for that one last match. But he had previewed the fact that he didn't want to meet any girls. But anyways, they were quite lovely, I must say. They were just wonderful. There began a relationship with the most wonderful mother-in-law that anyone could ever ask for. I have to say it was my privilege to be her daughter-in-law. She was a beautiful, wonderful woman, a kindest woman. You know, she passed away at 95, but then my father-in-law was much younger, but um, just two of the kindest people. It was very, it was very, very nice. And, and really the whole, all of Kapil's family um, embraced me right from the beginning. I've been so blessed with his family to have them as in-laws. And did you have any shared values? Well, I think we have a number of them. Go ahead. First of all, I think family is of utmost importance to us. I think that we had very similar values regarding parenting. So we should say that we have two daughters. And I think that we had a shared value of wanting our girls to, to feel part of both cultures. I think we had a shared value of tolerance and belief that it is possible to be a Hindu and a Catholic. So the girls were raised Catholic and Hindu to celebrate the great things about the holiday of each, you know, of each religion. And then also, I think it was, of course, like all parents, um, education was very important to us. And also, we have always had a shared value of wanting to give back to our community, you know, do things for the greater good, and which I think is a feature in both religions. I think that those were some of the core values. Yeah, I don't think I can add too much to that. And, you know, these things develop over a period of time. I don't think we start with saying, you know, in our, in our relationship, there'll be the five core value. So the other part of the common interest is I think the, if you look at our journey, it's, it's got many phases to it. You know, the first part was really emphasizing the career. 
and Margaret had her own law career. I was in technology. So the good part was we both supported each other. She knew my co-workers and would participate in any events that we had and, and I would do the same. And, and there was plenty of travel involved, at least for me, you know, worldwide, international work and so on. And I think without her support, I wouldn't have been able to do that, okay? So those were the shared, shared values. And then the second phase was our, our children. I think it takes a lot of work. And Margaret did a lot of the heavy lifting there. So, you know, so there's the second part. The third part was then a lot of things were settled then, you know. The children were grown, we became independent, you know, our businesses flourished and go on. So I think for the last five, 10 years, it's been mostly, you know, what do we do now? You know, we enjoy our children, they're close by. We enjoy travel, we enjoy our friends. And, 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 and I think we were to say that, you know, we have a lot of different interests too. Everything is not common. And we support that. I don't think we rarely say no. You know, if you want to do something, say no, you can't do it. You know, that is generally not in our vocabulary. Second, we don't think we need to really go and ask permission to do things. I think we can make some independent decisions, but which over a period of time, I think we know what the boundaries are. You know? We cannot just do something that we know it will not work. And if there's certain things like that, then commonly talk about that. You know, how should we do it and so on. And we found out there's always a solution if you give it time. And, you know, time is a big tonic. Since you mentioned you've been together for 44 years, how have you kept the spark alive? Did you want to answer that first? <laughs> <laughs> I think spark is, you know, we, we are there for each other and we do things together. We celebrate each other. Birthdays are important to Margaret. Okay. <laughs> Her jewelry is important to Margaret. <laughs> uh, uh, anniversaries, travel. And so all those things, throughout the year there's something happening. And that's one way of you know, showing you love her, that, that she means something to you. And so that's what keeps it alive. And then you know, uh, looking at, uh, always listening, what are her preferences and desires? You know, I really want to go there, or I want a party, or her needs, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, emotional or it's material and so on. So I think it, it further boils down to listening and seeing what's important and uh, making sure you're taking care of those things. That's what I would say. What do you think, Margaret? I would say that that's very true. I was going to harken back to an expression my mother used to have where she would say, still waters run deep. And what, what I mean by that is I don't think we have ever been the kind of couple where you would see us even when we were first dating or whatever at a party or something where we would be uh, lots of uh, displays, of, public displays of affection. Kapil is a very reserved person and I, you know, tend to be shy in those quarters too. And so I think that, and it's funny, when I do see couples who, you know, are just, I remember being on a, a flight to India one time where this couple shared the same seat. And I thought, you know, that's a little bit above and beyond. But anyways, but I think that with those kinds of things that sometimes that is not necessarily a measure, real a real measure of, you know, the relationship at all. That's a, you know, a lot of times that's just to please other people, but not necessarily yourself. I think we've kept the spark alive because of this shared history. Because for us now, the shared history is 51 years. You know, when, when you met in March of 1973, um, and now here we are in um, February of 2024, we have this, you know, great shared history. And I think that that spark is also, for me, it's also just this continued appreciation of this life we've had together. If someone had showed me my life, as, you know, when I first met him, that what my future life would be, I would have thought, no, it's not possible, you know. So anyways, so that was, that's been good. So it's, again, I think it's just a shared appreciation. But in case when people watch this and they say, I wonder why those two weren't holding hands, it's because, you know, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> And uh, do you have any relationship rituals? Uh, I 
like Kapil mentioned, I think we do celebrate occasions. We really do, as both as a couple and as a family. And so a lot of times we'd go to the temple together, maybe on my birthday. Yes, yeah. Or we go to you know the church, you know, around Christmas and Easter yeah. and all that. Yes, yeah. We celebrate that, and uh, girls go to the temple with me on special occasions. Or we'll have pujas at home. And we call the pandas at home. Yes, call the pandas at home. Pujas and all that. So mm -hmm. they experience all that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you love to celebrate anniversaries and you've celebrated some 44 anniversaries together. Do you feel there's a pressure to like outdo the last one? Oh yes, there is. <laughs> 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 In terms of, you know, what else can I get her? Yeah. <laughs> What's the next jewel we had? But I think, I think it's all worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's fun. It's very, yeah, it's always hard for me to try to think of, uh, my girls are always, our daughters are always asking me, what are you getting dad for our anniversary? I don't like, you know, because really the guy has, has, he has a short list, let's put it that way. So, it's, but that's not my style. Do you have a favorite memory with each other, one that particularly stands out? I don't know, there's so many of them, I don't know, there's one. I do remember very clearly coming to India in 1980. So we were married in a Catholic ceremony in Pasadena. So then in India in 1980 was nothing like it is today. And after having been through a very involved American wedding, lots of bridesmaids and all that, a very traditional wedding, then we came here and we had a small Indian wedding, but then his parents had a very lavish, huge reception. And it was such a change because all I had to do was be pinned into my sari and try to get my hair in order and then all I did was say namaste you know and very nice to meet you for you know maybe 600 times it was a huge reception and that was it I just had to show up it was so nice we had at his parents there was a sangeet and I had no idea what a sangeet was nobody really explained it to me and so I got there and I mean it was at his parents home and I came out and you know and then these women were singing, but of course in a language I didn't understand, and I didn't even really even understand that it was really directed to me as a bride, you know, and in those days there were two beverages available to women at a party, which was like a lemon-lime, limka they called it, this lemon-lime soda, or this, I think it was called Thumbs Up Cola, something like that. And this, not that this wasn't true in America, but you know, the, the party divided between the women and then the men were in another room and of course there they were past you know scotch and you know whatever but Kapil managed to because I was so nervous you know he managed to sneak in a, a little bit of alcoholic beverage into my um, thumbs up cola so after a while I was pretty I was okay I look back and treasure a lot of that we celebrated successes along mm. the way professional successes and also the birth of our two daughters mm -hmm. I think those were the landmarks I would mm -hmm. say What's your favorite or the most cherished quality about each other? Kapil is such a, a very humble individual. First of all, he'll never ask you, you know, what you do and, and how much money you make or anything like that. Despite the fact that he's been incredibly successful, when, you know, when he's asked, what do you do? I'm an engineer. You know, and of course he was so much more than that. And so I love that quality about him that he's so humble and understated and far more interested in um, other people and, you know, about them than necessarily telling them much about himself. I think the other thing is that I've been so fortunate. I just feel I got the best man in the entire world. I'm so incredibly lucky with that, that he has been a wonderful both husband and father to our daughter and now grandfather. He's very close to our daughters and we do feel very blessed and thank God all the time for the fact that our daughters, uh, we have wonderful son-in-laws who we consider really our sons even though we never had had any and now we have been blessed with three grandsons which is a very new world for us since we had daughters. You know the things that I um, love about him so much and that he is very very kind and attentive and does like to surprise me with a few things. And as far as Margaret concerned I think you know she's very understanding and accommodating. 
But if you consider that, you know, before I entered her world, she knew very little about the Indian culture, Indian traditions, the Indian food, and all that. And, you know, she's been very open about that. Whereas I didn't have to change much. I was already living here in America. I did too, but not to the extent that she did. And I think, you know, a lot of my Indian friends and so on, she's just as comfortable with them and, and they're as comfortable with her and so on. So I think that has made a big difference. I don't think they have felt like, you know, she's a foreigner or she doesn't fit well within us. So so I think very fortunate about that. And I think that, you know, that makes life easier for me. So you don't have to fight about it all the time or say, you know, she should have done this or didn't do this and so on. It's mostly automatic. And since you mentioned your daughters just got married, is, is there some advice that you give them? I think we could see that they had chosen very well. An interesting thing that happened, Kapil is very, very close to his daughters. You know, I think they mean the world to him. Uh, in both times, you know, there's this tradition of the prospective bridegroom asking. Sometimes it was just the father for the daughter's hand in marriage. In the case of our youngest daughter, um, her husband um, asked, took us both to lunch and told us he was planning to propose, etc. And Kapil told both of them that it was his expectations that his daughters would remain close to him. And he meant close geog geographically. geographically. Unlike many, many of our friends whose children have moved to other parts of the country, we are privileged privileged and so thrilled that our daughters live within a mile of us and literally within two blocks of each other. They're very close. And so we are so blessed by that. So when it comes to these grandchildren, of course, it, it, that's a two-way street. We also help a lot. But on the other hand, we get to see them, you know, rather than only, you know, once every six months or something like that, if they lived at other ends of the country. And I think they also understood that we'd like them to be independent professionally, you know, not dependent on their husbands for uh, mm -hmm. sustenance and so on. Mm -hmm. So they both went on and did their own professional studying and work and so on. So they're fairly independent. That way I think it's good for all of us, for peace of mind for us and for them also to know that you know they can survive. And I think it was important for them to do that before they considered getting married. Mm -hmm. And what was that one thing that you wish you had known in the beginning of a relationship or maybe something you thought you would have done differently? No, I'm not sure looking back I would do anything differently. So you can always pick any small item and criticize it. I should have fired this guy, hired this guy, made this deal. But then you have to take a look at a larger picture. Did everything work out in total? And the answer is yes. And I think that's what you had to look at. Because if you start looking at, you know, I should have wore green, I should have wore red, so on. Did it make a difference in 20 years? You have to always put that in perspective. And I think that's some of the challenges that young people have sometimes. You know, I was reading someplace that it's good to not worry all the time. And so this wise man said, you know, do not worry about little things. And if there's something big, break it down into small things. So, so then everything becomes small and small things you can manage. So that's been my perspective. Things have already happened, move forward. All you're doing is trying to overanalyze and fix problems that have already gone away. It really doesn't help you. So move forward. Couple Uncle, you mentioned that one of the most enduring qualities that you found in Margaret Auntie was that she was very ambitious. Why do you think that was important for you? I think it makes life interesting. You know, I think there's no ambition, then it becomes boring. You know, you always want something interesting to talk about, something exciting to talk about. And if you have that, then you can, you know, have conversation with friends, etc. They find that interesting. So I think it opened up a lot of avenues. If it was no ambition, then it's a closed mind. So what do you talk about every day? So I think with ambition, you're out in the world, you talk to more to people, you talk about ideas. And so that what keeps the, you know, whether they call it a spark or not, that, that keeps the relationship interesting. Okay, so now we come to rapid fire. This is the fun part of the video. I'll ask some questions about each other and then you have to guess what the other person is going to say. What's her favorite movie of all times? I think she likes uh, romance movies, Jane Austen movies and uh, British uh, detective series. So, uh, you know, old, old style movies a lot. 
you know, there are a lot of series like uh, Bridgerton these days, uh, uh, Downtown Abbey. Downtown. Downtown Abbey. Not downtown. So, yeah, Downtown <laughs> Abbey. So I think the old classic uh, romance uh, movies. Um, his favorite restaurant in California. Oh, I would say his favorite restaurant is the French Laundry, which is up in... Uh, the wine, wine country. Wine country. Napa. Yes. One thing that she always has in her bag. Diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, not in my purse, but anyways, whatever. <laughs> well, you can see her right now. Okay, yeah. never mind. You're just going to have every, um, every pickpocket in California out for me in about <laughs> when we return home. <laughs> Find that Margaret Nanda somewhere. His idea of a perfect vacation. Oh, I think, first of all, it includes some good hotels, uh, good restaurants, and some um, sightseeing opportunities. A lot of times we love, you know, we've hired a private guide or something to really enhance the experience and this and that. So, but again, I think always some good food is pretty important too, to try new restaurants and that kind of thing. You mentioned that you still uh, have the dress that you wore on the first date. Uh, do you remember what she was wearing? No, I don't. I do. He was wearing a... I um, remember a blue, blue sweater? Yes, he was wearing a blue v-neck sweater and um, a shirt and, of course, trousers. And then, and my... Um, so he was greeted at the front door by my parents and my mother was holding... She had a small dachshund dog at the time and he was out on the front porch and I introduced him to my parents and um, his... His roommate's car was down there at the end of the driveway, and off we went. But anyways, I do remember that very well. And then it was it was a very nice sweater, which I think he then shrunk in the wash or something. <laughs> so he doesn't, it's not preserved. But And what were you wearing? So I was wearing um, some white pants and a floral blouse, a printed blouse and a, a jacket over it. This was, uh, there was a brand at the time. And I'd gone shopping with my uh, mother the day before and we had picked it all out. And then I remember asking my mom, you know, what, sh what should I, if he wants to have a cocktail, what should I order? And she said, oh, get a margarita. I said, okay, I'll get a margarita. <laughs> so I did. Um, what color are her eyes? I think they're green. I think they're blue. Yeah, more than that. No, okay, not, blue green. They're not yeah, they're more green than blue. <laughs> we 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 spend a lot of time gazing into one another's <laughs> eyes, <laughs> as you might imagine. These questions are for the both of you. Who said I love you first? Oh, I think I said it first. Probably. <laughs> yes. Who made the first move? Well, I think you initiated the first kiss. Yes. Yeah. Um, who tells better jokes? The funnier one. Me. But Kapil has a good sense of humor, but <laughs> yes. I think I got my father's sense of humor, and I do think that um, humor has been a big part of our marriage. Actually, I just think, you know, it's better to be lighthearted than not and to kind of look at things through a humorous lens whenever you can. Whenever there's a conflict, who says sorry first? I actually think Pill does. Yeah. You know, one of the things about the arguments, etc., that I think the best way of handling that is sleep over it. Because I think a lot of times there's an argument and you want to do something about it right away. You know, you want to confront, do I have a confrontation or a disagreeable thing? And what I have found is that just sleep over it and the next morning it, it doesn't look so big. And so, you know, somebody will say, I'm sorry, and then it's just so, so much easier. It's very interesting that that goes against conventional wisdom, however, because, you know, there's a big tenet of people, especially, you know, that you never go to bed mad at each other, et cetera. So I think in a larger context, it's like, I don't believe in staying up half the night to try to settle an issue. You know, I think it's let's discuss it in the morning or something kind of thing is what he's really saying as opposed to. Who organizes date nights? You know, we won't call it a date night per se, but we do go out with friends and activities, so I think I do that, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does actually. 
thank you so much it was so lovely to have this chat with you i'm so sure our viewers have learned so much from this video oh thank you most welcome gosh if you enjoy the video please like and share it and subscribe to verona for such beautiful content verona matchmaking reimagined